Welcome back to Breakfast Central. This brand new week, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. It's been quite an interesting weekend yesterday, or fortunately was a very sad one as it marked the 10th anniversary of the kidnap of the Chibok girls. And we hear that a number of them are still in captivity. This is one of the stories we're looking at this morning on Breakfast Central. Now, after being away for, for a long while, enjoying life outside Nigeria, my co host <laughs> is back. But I am Olive M.O.D. and uh, yeah, that's it. I am Osaogi Ogbon. Great to be back. <laughs> yes, now you have to go and enjoy your life. Well, well. How, how did it feel to be away from Nigeria and just watch the blue waters? Um, it, I mean, it was, it's a regular holiday. It's the way it always is. You know, so <laughs> relaxation, you know, and that's, that's really what, what the, the aim is every time. That's really I love you so I much, mean, the I'm energy. Really you're so humble. Anyway, anyway. Great to be back. It's a Monday morning. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast Central. We hope that the next two hours, um, you, of course, enjoy the conversations we're about to have. Like Olive did mention, um, it's 10 years since the, kid, uh, the kidnapping of Chibok girls. Some of them are still in captivity. Many of these parents and these family members have lost hope of ever finding these girls ever again. Those, of course, who have uh, been victims, who, you know, who um, um, became victims beyond just the kidnapping, you know, still have stories to tell uh, from the incident 10 years ago. The person who was governor in that time when the kidnapping happened currently is vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And so many questions need to be asked you know, with regards to the Chibok kidnapping and, of course, you know, um, what Nigeria has been able to do for itself security-wise post the kidnapping. We will talk about some of these things in detail sometime during the show this morning. We, remember, we need to remind you to also join us on our social media platforms at New Central TV. We also have Dashin Usman joining us with Breakfast Headlines. Good morning, Dashin. Good morning, Olive. Uh, well, I only see Olive right now because, uh, Osalge, I don't think your absence was missed too much because you came back empty. So. Well, Dashin, I, you're <laughs> probably not very excited to see Osalge back. Um. No, he, he didn't come with anything for me. He didn't, he didn't come with anything for me. So. No, no, no. So okay. he's just resumed work. Yeah. I'm pretty sure what he came with is in the car, and after the show, so we'll share it with all of us. If nothing is shared by today, then tomorrow we'll declare problem. <laughs> by the it. way, it's, 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 it's good to have you back with Aoge. Thank it's you good very good much. Great to be back. Well, um, I, I want your thoughts on 10 years post uh, the uh, Chibok kidnapping. Um, what, what, what are the first things that come to mind? Well, the first things that come to mind, you know, uh, when it actually happened a few years ago, it was um, a dampening moment for Nigeria, I must say, and uh, also for the people of uh, Borno State. And like you did say, uh, the, the then governor of Borno State uh, is the present vice uh, president of yes. Nigeria. It's quite sad, you know, everything that actually happened to the girls, we followed the stories you know, thoroughly, we, 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 we were aware of the fact that these girls were forcefully, you know, uh, uh, married off to uh, Boko Haram commanders. You know, they had children. Some of them actually escaped, you know. And I did see a documentary of uh, a mom that still is patiently waiting for her daughter to return back. And I couldn't help but cry in that moment. I, I don't know. I was actually going to ask, do you see the similarity between, you know, the kidnapping in Kaduna and also that of Chibok? You know, over 200 school children were kidnapped within Nigeria. But the difference is in Kaduna, you know, it only took them like a week or so to be able to rescue these kids. But till today, we're yet to actually, you know, uh, uh, find out what has actually happened to some of these girls that were kidnapped in Chippewa. Right. I mean, the, the mother, the story you mentioned of the mother who still is waiting for her child, I also saw that. Um, Stephanie Busari of CNN did a detailed report, and I had seen that and seen some of the stories, and one of them was that mom, and she says she washes her daughter's clothes every yeah. other day, arranges the room, just hoping she that she will come back. back. In some way, when, they, when you lose a loved one and they die, there's a part of you, yes, that dies with them and knows that you will never see them again. But just leaving without that closure of knowing if your child is alive or your child is dead, of knowing that they are probably somewhere being abused, of knowing that they probably have forcefully, have forcefully been married. Or have they've been totally terrorists. brainwashed. Is it, is the deepest form of heartbreak any parent has to deal with. Yes. There were several reports of these different women in that report. There was one of a 26-year-old woman. She was kidnapped when she was 16. 
she got married to a Boko Haram uh, terrorist. And at the time, she was told that that was the only avenue for her to be able to get away from being abused. She got married to him. Eventually, she came back. And now she has a child that is being bullied in school and referred to as Boko Haram's daughter. You know, so there's so many stories and, of how this has really um, impacted their lives. But I do think that we have failed. Nigeria has failed but, these you know, and, women. And, and, and Olive, not, let's not also forget that back then, Nigeria had all the help that they could get. And I mean from international communities as well. So what went wrong? Well, um, you know, like you said, you know, the, the opinion that Nigeria failed these young women is very, very strong. And I'm sure everybody would agree with that. Um, I've spoken, you know, at length, you know, at the trauma that um, many hundreds, I mean, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, millions of people even, have had to deal with, you know, as a result of these failures. And unfortunately, it seems like the country has even moved on from the uh, Chibok kidnapping. If not for the 10th year anniversary, I'm sure we wouldn't talk about Chibok today. Neither will we talk about it next week. You know, the, the country moved on. We've gone to do other things. And, and of course, you know, we still remember that as of 2023, 2023, 2024, there are still mass kidnappings in Nigeria. So it doesn't even really feel like the country got better security-wise. No, it did Or did better security-wise in the last 10 years. I so, feel that what that did, in fact, was that it set a precedent to let them know that it's actually possible to carry out mass kidnappings, get attention from the country and the world. And we've seen that replicated a number of times, the most recent being the uh, yeah. Kuriga kidnapping in southern Kaduna. So there are more of these that have been happening. Again, like we say, Nigeria has failed these women. And Nigeria has continued to fail our young people. We will not yeah. stop talking about these stories and hoping that one day these families can be reunited once again. Dashen, Absolutely. thank you so much for joining us. We'll have you bring us breakfast headlines shortly. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I'm Darshan Usman. Now, uh, the headlines begins in West Africa, where Chairman of the Nigerian Labour Congress Political Commission, Comrade Titus Amba, has expressed deep concern over the turmoil gripping the Labour Party, emphasizing that the party's founding principles extend beyond more or mere electoral contests. Amba, represented by Professor Theophilus Ndubwaka, at the commission's meeting with stakeholders to rebuild the Labour Party, stressed that the party stands as an ideological movement dedicated to promoting good governance and accountable political leadership. Consent judgment was recognized by the immediate past leadership of the Labour Party as a fulcrum for the reorganization of the Labour Party, especially given the long drawn crisis that has the bedeviled Labour Party and scuffled her progress. The crisis in the Labour Party is unfortunate and this development in this party is also inconsistent with the ideals of the founding fathers of the Labour Party, which was established as a... The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project has directed its focus squarely on President Bola Tinubu, urging him to shed light on Nigeria's loan agreements dating back to 1999. In a statement released on Sunday by the organization's deputy director, Kuala Wale Olua Dare, Sarap called on President Tinubu to compel relevant government agencies to provide copies of loan agreements secured during the administrations of former presidents Obasanjo, Yer Adua, Jonathan and Buhari. The Federal Road Safety Corps has issued a warning regarding false recruitment notices circulating online. Now, since April 4th, 2024, a deceptive recruitment notice has been making rounds on various online platforms, enticing potential applicants with promises of opportunities within the FRSC. However, Corps Marshal Douda Biu, through spokesperson Jonas Agu, has stepped forward to clarify the situation, urging the public to disregard these misleading claims. The Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission has issued a stern warning to business across the nation amidst concern over arbitrary price increases. In a statement released on Sunday, the FCCPC made it clear that it, was, it will not tolerate any form of price fixing. It emphasized the detrimental impact such actions have on consumers' financial well-being and the stability of the nation's economy. 
And let's head to the east of the continent, where heavy rains and flooding have killed at least 58 people, including children in Tanzania, since the beginning of April. April marks the peak of the rainy season in Tanzania. On Friday, eight school children died after their bus plunged into a flooded gorge in the north of the country. A volunteer in the rescue operations also died. In Central Africa, about 15 civilians have been killed in weekend attacks in the Beni region in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo in new attacks blamed on ADF rebels affiliated with the Islamic State. 14 civilians were said to have been killed on Friday in the several or in several places in the neighborhood as new attack targeted another on the night of Saturday to Sunday, leaving two more dead. And that's it on Breakfast Headlines. It's now back to Olive and Osaoge. Thank you very much, Dashin. Um, interesting stories as always. I've seen the one with the FCCPC asking Nigerians to report uh, uh, irregular or unfair uh, pricing. You know, I don't know how that's going to uh, work out because... Um, many Nigerians, first of all, don't expect that things, that the price of goods and services, you know, would ever reduce. Mm. You know, they usually say once things go up in Nigeria, it never comes down. Down. You know, it just down. stays that way. Yeah. Um, there's those who have also been calling, you know, for um, a reduction in the price of goods and services because, of course, the dollar is no longer 1,007 to 1,800. There's those who have responded by saying that, well, the goods that were bought at 1,700 or 1,800 need to be sold, you know, first. But you know, it, it will take a while, I believe, for prices to balance out um, and, you know, for people to be able to somehow, some way, you know, find um, a fair pricing with goods and services and, and the price of foodstuff. I agree. And I, I think that let's give it, say, like a month or two for things to normalize because I do agree with the perspective of those who say if they bought goods and services at the price of 1,007, 1,800 uh, naira to a dollar, you don't expect them to then reduce it to the current reality of 1,001 because that would be a loss to them. But so, yeah, let's give... not also forget that, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, traders also use the excuse. To, they use what? They use the excuse of, uh, you know, oh, uh, buying it at a very high rate, even if they didn't actually, you know, uh, get more money yep. from Nigeria. I mean, we, we can't really escape that, to be honest. People would always take advantage of situations. It's a situation now that yeah. I don't know how we can regulate. But I think the one thing we can do is say give it a little more time. Say but like should, should they be warning or should they, you know, go into town and, you know, make sure that, you, you know, can't, some prices... I don't, are... I don't think it's that easy, right? Okay. You know, so if it is for, like, major industries, um, FMCGs and the, and the likes, maybe you can. But for the woman who's selling eggs in the market, you can't tell how much she should sell her eggs. Um, because you also do not know that transportation has reduced for her to move her goods from the farm to the market where she sells it. It's the same thing with those petty traders, you know, SMEs across the country. Um, their realities, you, you cannot dictate for them, you know, and you can't force them to reduce prices because, you know, there's different, you know, pathways through which those prices, you know, are gotten, you know. And like I said, you know, you're not going to tell, you know, my mind you know, who's selling corn or selling eggs, or selling rice, that, you know, she needs to reduce her prices. She knows what she's dealing with, you know, to be able to get those things to the market and make some profit, you know, or, or the other. Transportation prices haven't reduced. I haven't seen that. Um, and, and I don't, I mean, petrol price hasn't reduced either. And these are some of the well, factors well, that affect... Well, it has, it's 10 era. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> anyway, all the best with uh, us. We hope that we, we, we all have to do this collectively. The one thing I must applaud them, though, for is the supermarkets have now started to put the pricing. So you already know, because before now, you can pick something and you don't know the price. But they have started to put the pricing back on the racks. Well, we'll keep following up with the story. Thank you, Dashin. Thank See you, you at so 9 a.m. Thank you, Asaf. All right. all right. And now to our top stories this morning. Remember to continue with us on social media at New Central TV. And if you have to leave your house, not to worry, we have you covered. You can stream live on YouTube at New Central TV. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome once again. Fresh crisis seems to be brewing in Delta communities over the disputed parcel of land between Afiasiri and Obova communities, both of Ugeli North local government area of Delta State, South, South Nigeria. This is coming barely a few months after some communities within the state couldn't resolve their differences 
that allegedly led to loss of lives and property. New Central's correspondent Austin Azu completes the report. Ogbowa and Afusere communities are both of Ugele Kingdom in Delta State. Both communities are said to have good records of cordial relationship over the years, especially when attributed to their intermarriages, commerce, culture, and traditions. Leaders of Ogbonwa community have converged on this hall to address the recent developments in their area. They accused a neighboring officiary community of erecting two signposts at the center of their community, within scriptures as welcome to officiary extension, goodbye from officiary extension. It is indeed not only worrisome, but also highly provocative that the officiary use pull down the signboard of Ogbonwa Secondary School, and in its place, erected their second signboard. However, by the special grace of God, Ogbonwa youths who were visibly angry were restrained by elders of Ogbonwa community from confronting the adversary youths while in the process of erecting the signboards. All efforts made by the elders of Ogbonwa community to resolve the issue through dialogue with Afisiri people have so far proved abortive. Meanwhile, Afisiri community leaders have revealed that the people of Ogbonwa are customary tenants in their community as they denied having any land dispute with her neighbor, Ogbonwa. The, the ancestral home of the Ogbonwa community is located between two to three kilometers from the present day Ogbonwa community. The pertinent question is that is it wrong that after community secured their land by erecting a signpost of their land? To advert another land dispute related crisis in Delta State, it is expected that the state government would activate all mechanisms to urgently intervene in the pending crisis between both communities. In Ugele, Delta State, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. Thank you very much, Austin, for that report. Now, let's move away from Ugele to uh, something that happened 10 years ago. What was meant to be a final examination in physics at the government girls' secondary school in the town of Chibok, Borono State, Nigeria, on the 9th of April, on the night rather of April 14 to 15, 2014, ended up leading to the kidnapping of 276 girls. Out of the numbers kidnapped, 57 escaped captivity after jumping from the trucks on which they were being transported. About 107 of the girls were later released, 16 were rescued by the military, and 96 are still reportedly missing. Meanwhile, the Myrtala Mohammed Foundation, MMF, says that 10 years after the abduction of 276 girls from Chibok Girls Secondary School in Borno State, 21 of their affected abductees so far released came uh, with 34 children. Uh, Joe Hansen is here this morning and is joined by Dr. Aisha Mohamed uh, Oyebodi, who's the CEO of Myrtle Mohamed Foundation. Good morning, Joe Hansen. Well, thank you so much, Oliver Nasagi. Well, this morning I will be joined by Dr. Aisha Mohamed Oyebodi. Now, she is uh, part of the um, persons, a human rights activist who has been at the forefront to ensure that the Chibok girls are brought back. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been 10 years uh, since uh, the abduction of 276 girls uh, from their secondary school. Can you share with us uh, what thoughts this brings back to your mind, looking at 10 years later? I think it's exceptionally sad. I don't imagine then when it happened that 10 years later, we'll still be talking about 91 girls still being unaccounted for. I think that is what is um, frightening about it. I, I feel that if um, 10 years after we could categorically say this is where the um, 91 girls are, give or take, without being, you know, um, exact, then there will be a sense that we've actually come to grips with the situation. We are behaving exactly 10 years later the way we behaved 
10 years ago. Everything seems to be in a state of flux, you know, and it's almost like we're taking, we're, we're winging the situation as we go along. We don't have a post-abduction protocol. We don't have we don't have any intelligence or a protocol for how we're going to we don't have a roadmap for finding the 91 girls. We don't have a roadmap for communicating with the families. We don't have even a roadmap for dealing with the girls. You understand where I'm going with this? You have a situation where at least one third of the girls may have been killed. Right. Girls have come back and said so. There's a list. You understand? And none of that has been communicated to the parents. No decision has actually been taken as to how that's going to be communicated. And then everybody seems to be operating in silos. I might be wrong. Maybe it's a communication issue. But the state government is operating as a silo. The federal government is operating as a silo. I believe elements of the military are operating as silos. We have um, a women's affairs ministry that may be operating as a silo. So you're seeing a lack of cohesiveness. How do we want to manage that? But the most traumatic thing is that since Chibok, at least 1,700 children have been abducted from Nigeria schools. This was based on a report that was released by Amnesty International. It is unacceptable. How do we not learn from something? How do... Our children are the most valuable asset we have. How are we not able to protect them in their schools? It's just heartbreaking. Well, the governor of um, Borno State, uh, Governor Babagana Zulum, has promised uh, to bring back the girls. And uh, it's part of his promise, the promise that he made while looking at 10 years after. What's your thought on that promise made by the governor? If he can do that, it would be fantastic. And in truth, we have had wins. Because in 2016, when the first Chibok girl came out, we had almost two years of no news. Nobody knew where they were. And since then, at least, you know, 128 of them have come out. We still have 91 in captivity. So in that response, in that regard, yes, his response is a good one. But I think that it's time for them to, for there to be much better communication around this you know april i always tell people april is one of the most challenging months for for me and for a lot of us who are involved with this work because that's the parents are in a state of despair you know um the one 91 children is a lot of children you know i tell people you know every time i have this interview you're sitting in your car if somebody removes 91 parts from your car your car's not going to move do you understand? You know, and the, somebody who's talking to me from their library, if you take out 91 books, these are 91 human beings. And be rest assured, for every one Chibok girl that is missing, there are at least nine, ten other girls from other communities that we're not talking about. So yes, if he makes through his promise, perfect. But, you know, that is what we would like to hear. And it would be nice if there was a roadmap. To making true that promise now we do understand that the parents are also um part of this and uh, what do you think can be done for the parents so to begin with in the last 10 years um the foundation the mutala Mohammed foundation released a report three days ago 48 parents have died three were killed by boko haram the remaining died from high blood pressure all of those aimings that have to do with a lot of stress 48 parents have died. In fact, one of the saddest ones, you know, in the, in the girls that were abducted, there are four families that lost two daughters each, okay? The only family that actually recovered two, recovered both, almost five years apart. When the second girl came, a few months after her father died. So you can imagine what these people are going through. That's the first thing. The second thing is, honestly, we don't have a post-abduction protocol. I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that now the parents are having this long-running battle with the, the state government about the girls who have chosen to stay with their captors. I'm not making a judgment either way because this thing, you know, really the responsibility falls on us. We allow those girls to stay too long in Boko Haram captivity. You have girls, if you imagine a 13-year-old girl, 
I'm coming back at 23. She very much has lived half her life with insurgents. So I'm not making a judgment whether you know that choice makes sense or not because that ha has to be left to the experts that has to be left to the psychologists and the psychiatrists who are going to have to take it all to all apart but i can tell you one thing though is that it must be really hard for a parent to say you know because those girls left as adolescents they were still at that age where they still needed a lot of guidance from 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 their parents and they were taken away they were taken away to a group that everybody knows is particularly violent you know they have come back i have girls who have come back with four children our report also shows that a total number of 34 children were born to the chiba girls they came back with 34 children i mean you need to understand what these parents are going through they're traumatized really traumatized so i think a lena there has to be a lot more communication there has to be a lot more empathy there has to be a lot more concern has to be a lot more care and i know that there will be the whole argument that yes maybe we should face looking for the children first but it's not a you know one one or one thing that solves a problem you have to take a holistic approach we need to tend to the children we need to tend to the the i'm talking about the chibok girls themselves we need to tend to their children we need to tend to their parents do you understand what I'm saying? And in all of this, we also have to understand that truthfully, those girls have now come back as adults and they've come back with children. And anybody that knows what parental instinct does, it's a totally, it brings in a totally different line of, of thinking. So these are all the things that we need to take into account um, when we are trying to see how do we resolve their trauma, how do we help them cope? Because that's one of the things that we need to help them do. And by the way, there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of stigma for kids um, whose parents whose children have come back with children. A lot of stigma for those whose um, children have not come back because they are being um, taunted as being parents of Boko Haram wives. So there's just so much that's going on here. But the other thing we've done is we've truncated these children's education. You know, girls who are coming back 10 years after, really, what is the plan? You know, most of them, I'm sure, are going to find it difficult at this particular time to go to school, right? But 10 years after, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very complex situation and we have to acknowledge the complexity of it. I think trying to give a linear, simple solution to a complex problem is just going to put us in, in trouble. I'd like to say thank you very much, Dr. Aisha Mohammed, for joining us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's back to you, Oliver Nassar again. But then again, it's a, a sad situation uh, to see that the parents, some of the parents have given up the ghost and some of these girls um, have not returned home. So it keeps our hearts worried every time we think about this. And counting to 10 years is well enough uh, to make one wonder if there's any hope or we'll continue to keep our hopes alive. It's back to you guys in the studio. Thank you very much, Joe. Indeed, we'll continue to keep hope alive. Uh, this ha That was a very interesting interview, but a very heartbreaking one as well. Children having children, 34 children being born by these children. A number of things have been done. First, their childhood has been stolen from them. They never had the chance to actually be teenagers, to be young people, because they were right in the middle of captivity, you know, all through their teenage years into, as they moved into adulthood. So they've had their childhood stolen from them. There's going to be such a huge, I mean, there was already a huge trust deficit, but they wouldn't trust that this government can take care of them or provide for them or has their best interest at heart. And even the ones who are still in captivity, I oftentimes just, I wonder what's going on in their minds to see that the world has just moved on from them. The betrayal they must feel, that Nigerians can just go ahead with their lives and just forget about them there. Yeah, I mean, which is exactly what has happened. Um, I, I, I don't think we care. You know, I feel, you, and, and this is maybe not the TV friendly thing to say, but it's the truth. I don't think we care as, as, a, as a people. As Nigerians, we don't care. Um, we have gotten used to not caring. We have gotten used to hearing these stories and um, maybe they've happened too many times. It's no longer shocking for anybody anymore, you know. Um, I don't think anybody understands the severity of what we're talking about here. That 10 years ago, 200, uh, almost 300 Nigerians, uh, kids, 
were kidnapped and you know 10 years later we're talking about them giving birth some of them have died some of them escaped some of them are still in captivity some of them got married to their captors and we're talking about people who were teenagers even below the teenage age some of them um getting married to terrorists i don't think we really understand the severity of it and how we've really just moved on and un unfortunately we are also I, i've i've said this before but in a different way with different examples but the same context that i feel like the things that have happened in northern Nigeria for the last 10, 15 years, um, or even more, has shown that to a large extent, Nigerians do not feel the same level of empathy towards northerners as we feel with, with other people. Um, I, I, I don't, and I feel it's also because of the leadership of northern Nigeria and the way that they've also treated these people, you know, and, and the level of poverty and the level of attention that governance has, has been given to these people. It hurts to see, and I, I, I don't know if I have to remind everyone that these are 286 Nigerians. These are 286 girls. These are 286 human beings that had lives, that had a future, but they don't. I mean, that's gone. That's completely gone. And the trauma, I've spoken about this before also, that the trauma that you know, will be gotten from northern Nigeria, the trauma that those people have had to deal with, those who are currently in IDP camps, those who are currently at home, those who are currently in every part of northern Nigeria that have had to deal with terrorism and the offshoots of terrorism in the last 10, 15 years, it's trauma that would almost never heal. Because it's actually we've moved continuing. On. It's we've, continuing. It's continuing yeah. not just with them, it's continuing to the next generation of children because the ones who were children yesterday are mothers today, mothers not by choice, mothers by circumstance. And I mean, their children will have to deal with the trauma of being labeled Boko Haram children. They're going to keep living in fear. And beyond them, there are other children, the Kuriga, you know, children who have been kidnapped. Oh, yeah, she did mention that. Yeah. That 1,700, you know, kids have been kidnapped since, in the past, know, since then. Yeah. You know, and even years. in 2020, late 2023, or even 2024, we're still talking about kidnapping, mass kidnapping in Nigeria. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's hurtful to really just reflect on what these things mean and what really we have done to these children as a country and what we've done to these people as a country. It's very, very painful. Um, I hope, I mean, the, the Borno State Governor released a statement yesterday saying that they are still actively, you know, trying to find these kids and they're still working towards rescuing these kids. Nobody believes that, if we're being honest. It's Just a statement, like it is a statement that is expected that he will yeah. put out. Absolutely. No, everyone, that's what you should say. But in, if in 10 years you've not been able to produce 91 um, uh, Nigerians that were kidnapped, nobody believes you're, you're still looking for them. And, I mean, what do they mean? by the, they came back with 34 children so i mean they were impregnated by their terrorists while the nigerian government could not find these people in 10 years i mean you couldn't find nigerian citizens that were kidnapped in nigeria on i mean they they stayed long enough to get impregnated by their captors and we moved on had elections went to a, you know to, got new presidents and new governors and we've moved on it's such a shame, and it, it's, it's such a shame, and everybody should be ashamed of themselves from top to bottom. Everyone who was a part of, you know, government then, who has seen these things play out for the last 10 years, should be ashamed of themselves. The National Assembly that has seen multiple cycles, you know, uh, go past through nationalism in the last 10 years, and has not been able to take these people as the most important thing that you should be talking about. I mean, they've been there when more people have been kidnapped, so. It's a, it's a shame and yeah. a heartbreaking one. But we will uh, continue to talk about these stories today and uh, always. We keep highlighting them. And uh, we just want to send our, our hearts, you know, our heartfelt uh, condolences to those who have lost loved ones during the, who lost loved ones during the Chibok uh, incident, as well as those who are still waiting for their loved ones to come back. We hope that the government doesn't keep failing us and that they rise up to the occasion and do what needs to be done. We'll go on a break, and when we come back, we have more stories. It has been months of back and forth concerning the demands of the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, and the Trade Union Congress, TUC, on the minimum wage. Over the weekend, the organized labor union issued a fresh 615,000 demand as the new minimum wage for Nigerian workers to the federal government to absorb the economic realities affecting citizens and the country. The union says the current minimum wage of 30,000 naira can no longer cater for the well-being of an average Nigerian worker, adding that not all governors are paying the current wage award, 
which will expire by April, five years after the Minimum Wage Act of 2019 was signed by former President Muhammad Buhari. The act is to be reviewed every five years to meet up with contemporary economic demands of workers. The union thereby calls on the administration of President Bola Tinumbu to hasten the upward review of wage awards. Joining us this morning is Teofilo Sakatuba. He's a media practitioner and a social political commentator. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. It's been a, a, quite a journey with the Nigeria Labour Congress, demanding and rightfully uh, the increase. Many would argue that's rightful. The increase in the minimum wage, seeing how the cost of living has increased on all uh, fronts. But they initially said 1 million naira. Now they've come back to 615,000. When they said 1 million, many argued that it was not a possible or a foreseeable reality. Is 615,000 possible? Is it something that Nigeria can afford? Uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to be here and uh, to share my thoughts on the issue of minimum wage. Uh, the, the truth is that the labor is having a meeting by itself and uh, making proposals. Uh, I, I, I thought that they should not salivate their workers for nothing. Uh, 650 is an outlandish request, something that is completely out of the way. It's not realistic, it's nationally and statewide. Uh, but they will get something, but not 650. That I'm very sure. It doesn't make any economic sense. It's not practicable because minimum wage is not for federal workers alone. It's for both state workers and even private sector. And if you look at the, the inflationary rate that spiked as, re as re a result of West subsidy remover, uh, the dollar spike, which of course you see mellowing down. And so if we take the knee-jerk knee reaction, just react because the dollar has moved and the minimum wage is one million, then the dollar comes down, minimum wage therefore goes down. There must be a realistic conversation. And that is what the labor has not done. It's labor's figures are flying on around. We need that committee that has been set up by the federal government and labor to come to a congress of opinion and agreement. Then they can make talk to the public about what they, they think. Uh, but I believe they will get an increase because the current minimum wage, as you said, has expired as of 2024, uh, has already expired. Therefore, there is a very serious and critical need to review the Nigerian minimum wage. If you look at it, what is the reason why people live below poverty? They say below $2. And so every government must smartly look at, okay, we review that slightly above $2. And then we say the minimum wage is a living wage. And so my opinion, they will get something, but not 600. What, what, is a, what is a figure you think would be more realistic, you know, if the NLC hopes to get Okay, I, I thought we'll come to that later, but I am looking at 90,000. Okay. I'm looking at 90,000 maximum of 120. So is this 90,000 factoring, because I was trying to do the calculation now, is the 90,000 factoring the oh, slightly over $2 a day? Yes, that's, that's, I'm looking at also the, the, uh, the infl inflationary trend, yeah. the rate and the cost of living spike and the increment in various sectors in the economy, especially electricity, uh, the uh, first of the A need more than 90,000. Exactly. Uh, yes, uh, you see, the 90,000, whoever lives around band A now, it's Should not, not a person who is, who is earning 30,000 minimum wage. It's not at the lowest edge of the wage. <laughs> because minimum wage means 30,000, that's the basis. People, a lot of people live in various opulent societies and communities. Uh, well, that are really uh, top top notch. So that's that is a consideration. But okay. I, I know some retirees and all of that still live in areas. I learned that people who in some estates around your studio are holding meetings to see how they can be moved to band F or band B band. <laughs> the band people are now asking to be moved out of that premium <laughs> band. <laughs> okay. Uh, you've talked about the more logical, the more realistic figure yes. being around 90,000, even though they are currently demanding for 615,000 naira per month. Let's look at the NLC and how it's handled matters concerning the Nigerian workers. Would you say that the NLC has been a body that, or the NLC is a body that the government actually respects and recognizes, or would you say that the NLC has failed the Nigerian worker? Uh, over the years, uh, the NLC has lost his voice and it started losing his voice gradually by by compromising his position sometimes they come with a hardline position and it dissipates without the benefits of the reason why they came up with that position uh, that has affected the nlc's voice over the years so people 
And because the NLC seems to always agitate for reduction of prices, and any time any, any aspect of, of government is about to increase a price, that's when they, they spike. They never agitate for good governance. They never really agitate for uh, improved uh, work uh, conduct in terms of output of workers. They've never fought any organization for, uh, and then ask their workers within those organizations to improve their service delivery. And so when you see the pattern of their fight, you cannot always say you can't increase this price without considering the input, the cost of generating electricity, the cost of distributing and transmitting. Have you looked at those figures? Is this an unrealistic request? Have we, are we paying the right cost for electricity in Nigeria? Have you come to this conclusion before you always agitate? So when you agitate only in one direction, people begin to wonder if you really mean well for the general development of the country because the country belongs to all of us and if you are NLC, you must also be seen to championing uh, a, 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 the greater good of the country and you also demand a great output from your workers so that because it's a, com a combination of, 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 of improved work, uh, hard work that produces a progressive uh, nation and economic development. So you can't continue to say, don't reduce this, don't reduce that. Oh, this has gone up. Uh, we must get more. We, you keep asking for more. But what are you putting on the table for Nigerians to appreciate? And also recently, when the Labour started dabbling, when they created the Labour Party, and they are now going to own it, uh, they were play, keeping a safe distance until now said, you resign, it's our party. So government will say, oh, so you're actually a political party. And so whatever you are doing is colored in political lenses. That was why the president said that they are not the only voice of the country because they have become uh, uh, a political organization or they own a political party seeking also for the office of the president. Huge, now, that was yeah, obviously yeah. going to you know, bite uh, them back at some point. You know, but you know, it, there's arguments you know, as to whether this is Joe Agero's uh, mishandling of the body or the NLC generally has just you know, lost um, track or lost direction in, in, in a few years. But... Before you speak on that, I, I, I want us to talk more on the 90,000 Naira. Um, and, you know, is this from your own personal analysis that you think this would work best? Um, there's the Nigerian um, Salaries and Wages uh, Commission, I, I think, you know, which is also meant to play a role in setting, you know, the right yeah. salary scale. Um, with what you've seen, private sector, state government, local government, you know, the federal government, is... Can they do better than 90,000? I do not see the possibility. You know, first of all, you know, Nigeria, you have to make, the, you have to generate the revenue before you can spend. And if you look at our revenue has been very, very abysmal. It's just now, we're now beginning to see some, some uh, spike, some increase in revenue. The revenue is improving. Don't forget that all of the, the combination of all the, uh, revenue losses that we experience in all corruption points lead to low revenue for the country generally. Yeah. And all of these people are also members of the NLC. And so there is a very big need. You, can, you see, many states, if you if you've approved 90,000 today, I can assure you, more than half of the states in Nigeria will struggle. And this is why some school of thought believe that there should be a national benchmark, but every state should be allowed to tinker around the national minimum wage based on their capacity and it will not be fair also to say that somebody who live in Zamfara or live in Yobe will earn the same as salary with somebody who live in Lagos where prices and cost of living is significantly different. Same thing so, with the private sector. Yes, the same thing. So I believe that with the national minimum wage fix, states should be allowed to determine their own in, with negotiation with their workers based on prevailing realities in their environment. Don't you then start to see like an, a massive influx of Nigerians into certain states, maybe the states that pay higher? I would assume that Lagos and Abuja will pay higher. Yes, but, and, but, but you also consider the cost upon you. You see people even move to where they are paying lower, where costs and conditions of living are better. Well, true. Yeah. Yeah. And this 90,000 that you're suggesting, with where we are, do you think that the Nigerian government will be open to that sort of suggestion? Because that will triple what is currently obtainable. Yes, because first, the current minimum wage has expired. The expiration of a minimum wage doesn't mean that it will always go up. It will also go down if economic conditions are, are very good, uh, cost of living is manageable, is attractive, is nice, is good. 
But in this particular case, uh, everything seems to have gone up over the years. The cost of all items, everywhere subsidies have, been, have, 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 have managed to cushion impact on people has been removed so that those areas can perform optimally. The cost of electricity increment for Band A is just to tell and prove to Nigerians that the Band A works and there's possibility of 24 hours of electricity if the right prices are paid. The band B, C, D will also come into the fray very no, soon. But there's an increment everywhere. It's not just band A. No, it's band A, really. There's it's no, band it, a, yeah. it's only band so A. The other people are still going I don't think I'm on band A, but I, I'm currently paying 225 No, you're on band A, effectively. That means you were not on band A, but you were moved to band A so that they can save you. I don't get 20 hours of the electricity. No, well, I'm sure you get if you do the tabulation. You have not checked it properly. Because if you get uh, light over the night, it's almost 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what we're doing here. Because I, I, do, not, uh, I, I mean, if, you're, if you are being charged band A yeah. and you're not getting band A services, there's a problem. You can make a report. We saw something like that okay. in Abuja where yeah. they were overcharged and then they were asked As to, to refund. refund. Yeah. So, yes. I, mean, I don't want to drag, you know, the my, my argument, B, but I know, my I B, I know what my reality is. My B was showing class B until this announcement. And when I bought, later I was told that we have been moved to band A. And I am, I am testifying that where I live, I, we have 20, 23, 20, 23 minimum. I, I, I would need to make an official complaint, that's what it means. Because yes, I know yes, I don't get 20 hours of it. Please, electricity. you can tabulate very, that very sure and that. make the report. They are bound to offer you 20 hours. That is the idea, 20 now, hours. My light went off at 3 a.m. this morning. Uh, is that your unit, your, your electricity unit, or the, no, 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 no? I mean, we, I mean, no, no. The, that was a general uh, light out, yeah. general light out. They suffer some setback. That's what I, 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 because I, I normally follow them. The light yes, at three a.m. Yes, at three a.m. It's oh, still, okay. it's still running. They tried to bring it back. They took it back again. Okay. My neighbors. <laughs> so what is, what is the future? You know, I like, I like what's going on. You see, okay. I have always, when I came back to Nigeria, I knew that Nigerians, the cushion on Nigerians was going to hurt us in future. I knew that we were not paying the right prices. Nigerians were, that the governments, Nigerian governments in the past were managing poverty. They were developing and growing poverty. You know what you call people live erroneously as if you are wealthy, whereas yeah. you are not paying the right prices for, 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 for goods and services. Everything was, a hotelier was, was, was running his diesel generators with subsidized diesel and petroleum. And transporters were running across the country. Yeah. And so you, you paid lower uh, transport courses, lower hotel rates, and all of that. Now, when governments decided to say, okay, we can't afford this anymore, everyone has to pick its bills, this is when you begin to see, uh, where you see impact on citizens that lead ultimately to higher productivity. Because it was easy to, to be laid back and feel that you are comfortable. Right. Uh, so there will be more efficiency. We, as citizens, have to be demanding on service providers uh, so that they don't look back at you and say, have you paid the right prices? No. That's why, just like you are saying, if you don't get 20 hours of electricity, you have to shout <laughs> and shout. Yeah. Uh, but the implication of 20 hours is that it will tell on your unit's consumption. So well, to be honest, I would pay. rather have had, <laughs> or I'd rather been in band A and know that I'm getting constant power supply than the epileptic you will, you will soon be in band A. That I'm, I'm buying fuel. Or you move day. to areas where band A is effective. Well, do I have band A rings? That's another thing. That, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> on a final note, yeah. what would you say is the future of work? What are some of the areas that the NLC need to focus on? There are people who talk about how multinationals only import their own expertise to fill in the key positions. And, you know, Nigerians are not given as much treatment as they should be given here in Nigeria. These are some of the complaints we hear workers talk about. So what would you say are some of the key priority areas? The priority areas that NLC needs to focus on, you know, that's, of course, not... Uh, ex excluding the minimum wage conversation? I think the NLC should be less political. Even if they have uh, bias for a particular political party, they should, as much as possible, you know, separate the office of the president of the NLC from the activities of their political party and on, on due interference. Another thing they should do is that they should begin to have a different and new orientation for national development, not only antagonistic uh, stance and position. Each time any agency say we want to, no, you have to be more engaging. You have to also, just like you are asking for a minimum wage for yourself, you should also look at the minimum cost input in businesses and service delivery. So I believe 
the NLC must be, must be more compliant in the global system that we operate today, not only an agitator or those who say they must always fight the government. Or those who call yeah. strike and then go yes. to close I mean, door meeting yes. and after so, that. So, I mean, so just answer the, the Joe Ajero question. You know, is this all he's doing or is it the NLC generally that well, have just lost track? <laughs> I've, the the LDC has not really lost track. It's just that they've gotten involved in things that seems to have drowned their voice and made their... Because, you see, every time they say they want to do a national strike, they are not able to mobilize nationally. Yeah. You know, that tells you that there's something wrong in the issues they are pursuing. They have to be sure that these issues are broadly... They do broad negotiation and have a general national consensus instead of having... Um, what you call a divided house most of the time. Yep. And so I believe they are still on course. I, I, I like Joe Ajero, you know, I like his, his hardline stance sometimes, you know, you know, spitting fire, breathing. But engaging, understanding the issues is the most important way to be an agitator. If you don't understand it and you just run into town and agitate, you lose like the crowd. Idea. You lose yeah. the people that are supposed to support All right. you. All right, brilliant. Your philosopher, Katubba, thank you so much for your time with us this morning. Hopefully, the next time we're talking, we've seen a review in the minimum wage and then we can start to look at all that. Yes, areas. and then we... But don't forget that uh, they, that will also be met with uh, increments in other areas. The landlords will increase their I mean, prices. I don't think Nigerians have yes. problems paying for services. So I mean, let me speak it generally, but as long as the, the services are available, good roads, great infrastructure, healthcare, education, let that be available. I think Nigerians will make adjustments with things. Absolutely. Them, but, and, um, I mean, these are continuous conversations we'll keep looking at. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Now we take you through the front pages of the newspapers, and we also will open the phone lines for you to call in and share your thoughts on any of the stories that we we'll be looking at. This morning we have a sunshine in human form. you see what I mean by that. He's a public affairs analyst. His name is Jotun Ojong. It's always a delight to have you. Good you morning. You look like the sun. Oh, thank you. And I must confess that I miss being on set. It's like oh, we miss having you. The sun on Bansi. Huh? It's like the sun on Bansi. Okay. He looks what? like... No, you know what? I, what? Okay. I'm not going to... Let's go not, to the there's something else I wanted to say, but I don't know if that, no, that's, an, I, I don't think that that's appropriate this morning, so I wouldn't say that one. But you do look really good. Thank you very Thank much you for joining us. Let's Thank head straight you. to the papers and see what the front pages are saying. Hopefully we can find some good news. Our first paper this morning is the Daily Trust newspaper. We uncovered more fraud in humanitarian ministry, ESCC. Of course, this is a follow-up from the conversation last week about the number of accounts they're investigating. Say... To say probe of past suspended officials used it 32.7 billion naira, $445,000 recovery. <coughs> Excuse me. Investigating abuse of COVID-19 funds according to the World Bank loan. 19 killed in Oyo Gomosha Road crash. That's a really sad one. 21 Chiba girls returned with 34 kids. Uh, 48 parents die of trauma. We also have here VSS ones. Uh, El Rufai's ally uh, over Facebook post against Governor Sani. US, EU, others warn Iran Israel conflict could destabilize Middle East. This has been a very, very devastating update. Like, just seeing how the drama keeps unfolding in the Middle East is really sad, what, it, what all that's happening there. Um, oil price may hit uh, $90, I think. I'm not, that's not quite clear. And Iran summons UK, French, German envoys over stands. Consumers decry low supply as discos prioritize band A. Even the band A is not really giving band A because Asalgi is supposed to be in band A and he doesn't even... Which band are you now? Abandoned. I think I'm, I'm abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> We're yet to see Naira gain. Food prices still high, according to Nigerians. Abducted Zamfara Varsity students, NYSE members, others rescued. So many stories to look at. I think we should start with the one that hits at the Nigerian people first. No. Uh, that will be the top two stories. Consumers decry low supply as discos prioritize band A. As well as we're yet to see Naira gain, food price is still high. Nigerians have been excited. We've been seeing a lot of gains in the past uh, few weeks with the Naira. The Naira has, you know, I think it should be about within the 1,100, 1,200 um, range, range yeah. from 1,008, 1,009 a uh, few weeks back. So it's been exciting times to see this. But Nigerians are complaining because they say what goes up, that the law of gravity doesn't apply in Nigeria because yeah. what goes up doesn't come down. So 
at what point, because the argument that a number of these uh, business people are giving is that they bought their stock when the dollar was 1,008. So how, at what point is it a reasonable t time? First of all, is that a good enough argument? And secondly, how much time is reasonable enough for us to say, okay, you should have sold out everything within that, um, within that every, everything within that purchase and that prices should then reflect? Okay. Um, I think for Nigerians, you can't tell. Um, for other people, maybe you can and um, because over the years, one of the reasons why we had um, this back and forth uh, with the government when the dollar was going up was the fact that uh, we, we, we came from a background where if anything goes up, it never comes down. So, and uh, thankfully, we have um, the dollar coming down. But again, the principle of wisdom says that uh, your ability to understand your environment and put critical infrastructure in place that will benefit your people is what wisdom is all about. We have known Nigeria that uh, most often because of our grid level, um, most often because everybody is surviving, um, because we do not most of the time believe in the government and we want to build infrastructure around ourselves. So our grid level has increased. So you do not live a community like that without um, creating what we call um, price regulation. Unfortunately, because the Nigerian government is not in business, carbon price regulation is a bit very, very difficult. For instance, if you leave Nigerians uh, importers of uh, petroleum product or sellers to determine what the prices will be, by now we'll be talking about 1,200 per liter. The government actually says, oh, you cannot move beyond this level. This is how much NNPC is giving it out, and this is the profit margin. And I think that should go for every nation. If you look at our population, if you look at our diversity, if you look at our religious inclination, one country that comes to mind is India. And one of the things that India did is that they understood the people and they felt that we cannot just leave them to determine what prices of product will be. So there's a peg. In fact, I remember that there are some super malls that you get to, that if you, if you give them your ID card as a student, they give you a special price. So I think beyond now, what we should do is to ensure that we regulate our economy system right. in a way that we know what profit margin right. is so that Just we don't allow... Let me hold on. Let's quickly speak with Akban, uh, who's calling from Uyo yeah. this morning. Good morning, Akban. Uh, good morning. Yeah, morning. please go ahead. Go ahead, please. Good morning, uh, Usa. I, I'm, I'm calling from Uyo. I want to say that this um, light thing you're talking about is just total rubbish. I have not had light. To be very honest, I have not had light. Do you know what band you fall under? Band A, B, C, D, or E? What band do you fall under? I don't even care about the band anymore. I don't care about the band. Band A, band B, I don't have light. So it is total rubbish. Uh, I mean, how, how long um, are we talking about now? Have you not had light this year at all, or has it just become worse? I can't even count the time, number of time I've had light this year. Well, that, that, well sorry to hear that. You know, it might be a, a, a thing tired. that you need to... I don't tire. I don't tire. You hold up with you. I don't, I, I don't have light. That's all. Yeah. We're, we're so sorry to hear that. It's a thing you may need to pick, uh, pick up with your electricity distribution company that covers uh, that area. I'm so, um, that. one of the very important things I was talking about, grid the other time, also extends to this part. And that's why... I want to beg Nigerians to actually go study what band um, they belong to. Because if care is not taken, you'll be paying for darkness. These people can actually charge you the, the fee or the uh, price for band A, even when you are under okay, band D it. or band, yeah. band E. So you need to deliberately also study where do you fall. And I also want to tell us truthfully that there's no how the megawatt of electricity we are generating or battery distributing because when you talk about generation we 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 are doing nine thousand at some points we will do ten thousand but the issue is distribution so if you have a nation of 200 and something million people and they struggle to um, distribute less than five thousand megawatt of electricity there's no magic there's no how you are going to have electricity yeah so that is the reality that so is... what should we be talking about we should be questioning the investments that have gone into making light available. 
because without electricity, all this economic grammar that we're going to, that we are speaking amounts to nothing. See, I have seen an organization, a very big multinational, who is struggling with prices here and there. And the question we keep asking is that, where do you move your prices? You move from A to Z today. What's the problem? All right. And they tell us that it's because they spend heavily in maintaining their generators across sites. And I agree. Let's get back to Uyo. We have Tom calling from Uyo. Good morning, Tom. Please go ahead with your comment. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Yes, am I on to Breakfast Central? Yes, please. Yes, you are. Please, please turn, turn the volume yes. of your TV down. Yes. yes, somebody just called from Uyo to tell, to tell us that there is no light in Uyo. Yes. Um, Tom, can you please turn on the volume of your TV uh, set? I think that is a lie. Okay. The, 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 the person is not being truthful because maybe... Yeah. It's a lot easier if your TV volume is down before you call. You know, it, it saves us some time also. Yeah. And helps you also get uh, through to us. We're oh, going to go oh, back to Mr. Ojo. Yes. Um, but oh, I, I, of in the interest of time, yes. because we also need to address other issues. You know, there's also the EFCC case um, that's on the Daily Trust there that I'd like that you speak on. They put out a long statement yesterday, um, you know, about monies that have been recovered from you know the humanitarian, you know, affairs ministry, Betayadu, and you know others, you know, and, and their names, and also spoke about the. Bobriski case, you know, reactions. Okay, so, so all of this, yeah. aside, um, aside um, the Bobriski case, yeah. points to one direction, which is greed. Because the essence of creating a humanitarian ministry is to make um, service to people in need faster. Yeah. If you've been in government before, you know that government activities actually naturally crawl. So when you have a ministry that attends to humanitarian, because disaster is not going to wait for you. Yeah. Disaster will happen when disaster will happen. So the essence of that ministry is to be able to attend to some of this issue quickly. And as a result of that, you may need less paperwork and you have access to more fund than direct fund to many other ministries. But what have we done with the fund? All right. We have put it in private pocket. So it's still the question of greed and it's across board. It's beyond whether somebody is in government or outside of government. Uh, before we head to our next paper, we have a call from Wari Udi. Good morning. Please turn down the volume of your TV set and go on with your comment. That I, I know the rules. Uh, you see, we are talking about NEPA. I was surprised that they do increase. I feel what they have, they have increased, they will meet up with that, uh, the supply. I mean, Wari, in my area, if I tell you, five days, I've never really experienced like it will come, it will go. It will come, it will go. When you ask them questions, they will say the, the natural grid is not bringing enough. And the whole worry is shared, you shared about several megawatts. So for the whole worry, so how, how, do, how can they distribute it? So the point is that if they wanted to increase, so me, I spend much on Google. I spend hell on diesel. If I spend less, as I should say, 600 in a month to run my house. So what I'm trying to say is that if they can supply the light and they increase it, nobody, Nigeria is happy. For me, myself, I'm happy. But where is the light? Right. Uh, the Dico, the Jenko, Abena Dico, where is the light? This is my point. Thank, Thank you. you very yeah, much. There's obviously, a lot, there's still a lot of you know uh, problems with the infrastructure to supply. Infrastructure. You, know, you can generate, you yeah. cannot distribute. Yeah. But and we, even if we need to be generating more, you know, we Please should. Be I think we need to go to thirty-three thousand for us to be able to get uh, constant power supply. Fifty thousand. So, oh, it's now fifty. Okay, yeah, because 50, I saw a report that said that well, if, if we are able to now, like you said, the problem is not even about generation because in our head we were thinking, oh, if we can generate more, but it's. it's Clear now that, that we can actually system. generate and be unable to to distribute. So, uh, so it, it's a question of infrastructure. We have an and infrastructure. When, when, when you continue to hear the billions that have gone into this thing, you begin to wonder then what is the issue with us as a people? Yeah. All right. So it, it's sad. All right. Let's quickly go to this Nigerian newspaper. This is what we can find there. Uh, we're working with time. It says the federal government not bound to implement IMF's advice on subsidy removal. Experts caution. Humanitarian ministry scandal, of course, the EFCC story once again. It says we've recovered 
of uh, 32.7 billion naira and $445,000, says the EFCC. What, what, what I think would be most you know, shocking or disgusting about this is after all these discoveries, we still do not see that people are going to jail. Because I don't know that Nigeria is still doing plea bargains or you know, telling people that, oh, okay, we know that you stole, but bring it back and then we can let... I don't think that's what we're still doing. I don't think that's what we should still be doing. So EFCC can put out these stories, and I hope that after they put out these stories and it is clear that they actually recovered money from people who took money, that these people will go to jail. You, you, you know why the issue of plea bargain will continue to pop up in our vocabulary? It's the fact that law is usually not logic. Sometimes you can steal 50 billion, and after prosecution, they discover that when they open the book of law, that the jail time is actually six months. There's nothing anybody can do about that. It's been written, it's been written. So what they do to ensure that, okay, the government does not run at loss at the end of the day, because most often the money you even use in prosecuting this case is, is huge. So what, what the government does is to say, okay, come, if you can return this money, we're going to let you go. So it depends on how, and that's why EFCC has a huge, a huge task beyond discovery. Re recovery is so important because you need a team of legal, legal mind yeah, that will be able to push up points Mr. Ojo, I, that I, will be able to get something out of it. I agree with you, but if, if you are not punishing offense, I totally understand what you're saying. Nobody would stop. And you keep the EFCC on this wild chase every six months of recovery, recovery, recovery without actually stopping theft. That, that's where the problem is. And if you say that, oh, the problem is, oh, you know, six months might be the jail time, I would, if I have 32 billion that I stole, I'll go to jail for six months and keep my money. I'll come out case. and bowl. Exactly. So, 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 so that, that, that's why law is usually not logic. But most importantly, you mentioned something that is very important. We must decide as a nation where we want to spend our money. Whether we want to spend our money on punitive measure or preventive measure. There's a systems, there are systems that have been created as far as civil service as far as government is concerned that makes thievery very easy and we can call it corruption it is stealing yes it makes it very easy if i give you contract i expect a kickback yes beyond the kickback i inflate contract without anybody saying anything and this is it's so bad that once the person in charge does not understand the document called your budget <laughs> once the person in charge does not understand the budget for example if you say 10 kilometers of road and it's 10 billion, questions must be asked. Where are you building this road? Is it in Aquaibon or is it in Lagos? Is it in Oshun or in, 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 in those states? Because there are actually some places that will got more money. Yeah. I'm going to cite an example from the southwest. Different state government. Somebody was going to do a 100 meter road across a place called Ore in Ondo state. It's, it's, it's just 100 meter bridge. The former governor of Ondo state actually a marked 5.8 billion. Oh, the wow. man is late now. His counterpart from Oshu built something that is longer in the same area, the same texture of land, and built it around 3.2 billion. But nobody is asking questions. We all go to church to say, oh, he has built something, and everybody forgets about that. So the manipulation of the process, corruption is actually better in the process of drafting budget. And once the people that are supposed to look into the budget, starting from the National the Houses of Assembly, are compromised from the very pros from the very beginning, and that's why you see they call your committee to come and defend budget. I put it to Nigeria that what they do there, they do not defend budget. If really they defend budget, cutlery will not come out year in year out in the budget of Asorok. If truly they defend budget, there are some figures you see, and you continue to ask yourself question. We see so it all the system. Time now. System, you cannot prevent corruption with the kind of system we have. And, and also the punitive measures. The punitive punitive measures. measures. Because if, if, whilst if, I'm not advocating for what happened in Vietnam, you saw the story yeah. over the weekend of the female business tycoon that was sentenced to death. Yeah. Nobody's saying, oh, you should sentence, sentence her to, death. to death. But there should be stiffer punishment, stiffer penalties. So that by the time people think, if I steal, this is what will happen to me, they would rather not because it's not worth it. But now it's almost like... I can't speak authoritatively on how, you know, the death penalty has reduced theft in Vietnam, but I'm sure that it definitely puts, you know, some VN people... The thing is that nobody will hear death and will not shake. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's um, not the truth. And our own case, in all honesty, I keep telling people, when I look at our election process, and people complain that, oh, our legislators are earning too much, I say, no, that's not even our problem. The problem is not the legal money anybody collects. 
The problem is the illegal money people steal. We have the resources to be able to pay those that are working for us. The amount of money we are paying them, uh, paying them at the moment, the, the election process they go through is so rig rigorous that whatever they are earning is not much. But it is the stealing that we are concerned about. If we allow our country to blossom, if we allow people to work and have a reasonable take home and nobody is dipping their hand or we curtail it, the way people dip their hands into our treasury, ma'am, Nigeria is going to experience a huge turnaround, overnight mm -hmm. turnaround. The All pace right. with which you know, we prosecuted Bob Risky, we can do the same thing with you. In Nigeria fact, I'm hoping you can speak on the Bob Risky case. Okay. You, 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 you see, and that's why I said that most often what we call law is not logic. Somebody may just want to, like my friend will always tell me, he says, if you beat a woman and you get to the court and the judge is a female, you don't go to prison. <laughs> so there are a lot of intricacies that are weaved into every matter you see in court. But again, there's something they call political will, which is resident in the heart of those in power, whether you are sitting as a judge or you are a legislator or an executive person. The way we experience, um, express it differs from case to case. I don't know what has happened, but I was a bit taken aback, especially when you just say, oh, go on uh, to six-month imprisonment, and there's no option of fine. Fine. And that is not to say that I have supported anything he has done. But again, the way we expedite yes. that yes. should it actually be quick. different from the you are yes. we, it to we are sure that if the FPF says it has recovered 30, 30 billion you know, plus, it shouldn't be so difficult to also have quick prosecution for those people. With All our politicians, also. very, very quick. Uh, exactly. You know, it should be very quick. And, it, you, it, know, and you know one funny thing, maybe I close with this. The way I'm hearing 30 billion, 30 billion in the Ministry of Humanitarian, maybe they actually love listening to David Do's song. So, <laughs> That's a good one. 30, right. 30 billion. Let's go to The Guardian this morning. Final paper this morning, The Guardian newspaper. On the front page of The Guardian newspaper, we see the big story there. Sticky prices, poor control, upset consumers despite stronger Naira. Tension in Middle East as conflict escalates and concerns for global markets. APC chief decries alleged funding of party by Tinumbu governors. Ekiti PDP berates Oebanji over 10 fresh appointees into bloated cabinet. 21 Chibok girls returned with 34 kids, report fines. And there are concerns over abduction of, uh, okay, I'll come back to that one. Over 17 million Nigerians currently food insecure, says firm. Wrong timing, misplaced priority for new electricity tariff. We've seen a number of people who you know, genuinely believe that. And concerns over abduction of men for marathon anal sex in Lagos. Well, mm. that was quite a shocker. Mm. Uh, maybe we should, uh, I don't know. What is happening? What is happening in Nigeria? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a bit shocked. I don't even know that people still have the power to do all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a very, very serious case because... People should uh, have the power to do what now? Whatever it is that we have seen in the newspaper. <laughs> I mean, that's where they pour Nigeria's anger into now. So when the country has upset you well enough, you, know, you have to find a way to you know, let go of all in, that In the midst of no light, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was saying it when this government came on board and I was saying it jokingly that um, if, if anybody gives birth. If any of my friends gives birth now, I'm going to give a special kudos because I don't know actually where they get the strength from. It's so sad. But um, let's, let's talk about how we run our country. Ekiti State um, gave appointment to 110 new aides. 110 new aides. No matter what it is, um, 110 new aides. It means that people in government see it as a way of finding food for the boys. People outside of government see it as a waste of resources. And like I said when I was opening, wisdom demands that you know exactly how your people are reasoning. Yep. Sometimes, because of the hardship in the community, you can make things better for your people by working in the direction of their thought. And it doesn't mean that you have stopped leading them. It's just that you want to create hope in them. You want to give them a chance to live again. So I, I, I because... The PDP said it's already a bloated government. I do not have an idea of how many people are already in the government. But again, I, I sincerely think that uh, when we are given appointment, we should be very, very careful, yes. especially in states where um, retirees, I'm so concerned about retirees, where retirees are still being... Get their uh, pensions. And, and all of yeah. that. And I think 
this cut across board. My, my, father, my father retired in uh, 2012. Yeah. He just got the first tranche of 300,000 of his gratuity oh, wow. last month. Wow. Yes. Oh, wow. This when? Um, 2012. 2012. What? He got a it point that I actually offered to, okay, how much is it? Let me, let me pay you. Then he said, no, I actually labored for the money. I want it. And imagine those who do not have the power to speak with anybody. I know what is yeah, even so, sad. The so value so of what the money was at that time. You he has see, lost it. If yeah. he had gotten the 300000 in 2012, imagine what he could have done yes. with it in 2024. So I, I think our government should, across board, because we make this mistake, and I, I often speak about it, as a person who understands how government works, I know that. I can look at the federal government and excuse them on a lot of issues. Because some of the things we are holding them responsible for, we should actually be holding our state governors responsible. Every state governor now is almost twice richer than how they were some months back because of the allocation they have access to. They have access to huge allocation. And because we are used to say, oh, Nigeria is not working, we just point to Abuja. But there's the need. For instance, the issue of housing, and I keep saying this, the issue of housing should be a priority. There are three major areas that should be priority for any state government. There's, there's no reason why people should be struggling with housing system when they have state government. So attention beyond all of these uh, paying political uh, people and all of that, we should pay deliberate attention to the welfare of our people in our um, state. Let's also speak on the 10th year anniversary of oh, the Chibok girl, girl kidnapping. Yeah. yeah, you know, one very funny thing that I've studied about life is that I do not want to make jest of anybody. I do not want to criticize anybody unduly because if you criticize without a cause, that thing is going to come back onto you. Now, President Tinubu was one of those people carrying placard all over the community when Chibok girls were ab abducted about 10 years ago. He could never have thought that he would be president of Nigeria today. And almost a similar thing will happen in his tenure. That cause for action on the system. It means that the system is porous. If you have policemen, if you have about 400,000 police policing 230 or 250 million people, it's a system failure. So instead of thinking that, oh, the past government didn't do it well, I think what they should be doing now is to concentrate on how to build a system that will not make this thing to repeat itself. And they should not read political minutes to anything. If anybody attacks us, let us attack them. Oh, it's happened already. I mean, yeah. it's repeated itself you yeah. know, over and over and over. <laughs> what are we talking about? It's continued to repeat itself. You know, even we on, we, on, we on just hope that ago. they will be able to build a system to prevent it. Well, yeah, yeah we hope. We hope. All right. Dr. John, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Unfortunately, you have to take your sunshine out of us. <laughs> we'll I'm always with you. you know. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to break now. When we come back, we're going to be heading to another very interesting story. Of course, we still have Which Way Nigeria coming up much later. We'll stay with us. Welcome once again to Breakfast Central. Let's uh, start, of course, to continue the news by telling you that over the weekend, the Oyo State Police Command arrested 20 suspected Yoruba Nation agitators who invaded the state government secretariat Akudi in Ibadan, the uh, state capital. The police spokesperson in Oyo State, Adewale Osefisho, confirmed the arrest of the suspects in a statement issued in Ibadan. The statement says that three pump action rifles, 29 live cartridges, two expended cartridges, 67 cutlasses, five bulletproof vests, and six pairs of boots were found in their possession. He also said they had in their possessions. 11 old Dua Nation camouflage uniforms, 10 public address systems, one unregistered bus, and three motorcycles, three barrettes with Odua insignia crafted on them, and seven belts. The agitator staged they plan to forcefully take over the Secretariat, but thanks to the collaboration with sister security agencies, successfully it was thwarted. Now let's take a look at this video. <laughs> You are useless people or like people are living in peace. You want to cause problems here in the urban nation. You are you are mad. Okay. 
Oh, one by one. Okay, another one. See another one. If you let it for the body. And there you have it. Uh, the gallant troops responded swiftly upon receiving the news of this attack, and uh, they, of course, have been apprehended. But who are these people? You know, where did they come from? Why were they there? It's a coup. Like we, it's an unsuccessful coup. But can we call it a coup if we cannot confirm that it's actually military? A coup on who now? Or your state government <laughs> or who? And, yeah. and here's the thing. I mean, because I did, you know, did um, follow up bits and pieces of the story. There's um, a certain lady, Miss. I mean, according to what I've seen on social media, Miss Mudukwe Onitiri Abiola, who, of course, you know, in a video... Um, declared secession from Nigeria, not very different from what um, the IPOB had done, you know, had tried to do. Um, I also saw, of course, you know, a, a video that she did, she was speaking Yoruba most of it, but so I couldn't really understand it. But, I mean, I, nobody really knows exactly, you know, who these people are and what their plan was. M very daring to expect that you would simply just wade into the Oyo State Government House and take over the seat of power. I'm sure that they knew that that wasn't going to be possible. Um, but they still tried, you well, know, so I, I'm not sure exactly what it was about. I Sunday Boho, of course, you know, the leader of um, uh, Yoruba's um, adjacent group also um, has, you know, denounced them, said he has no business with them or linked with them. They didn't send them any errands, you know, so um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, and we'd like to know further who they are. Well, let's hope that we can get answers this morning about who these people are and what exactly they want. Joining us this morning is public affairs and political analyst, Jide Ojo. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. I, we know you've been following up with this story. Do you have an idea who these people clad in foreign military apparel are? Who are they and what was their intention? I wish I know. Good morning. <laughs> I really wish I know. Um, I know that for, for a very long time, we've had the Odua People's um, Congress uh, that are uh, more like separatist group who wanted out of Nigeria. That was under the leadership of late um, Frederick Fashion, Chief Frederick Fashion. And then we had a breakaway faction led by Ghani Adams, who is now the Ari Onokakan for the Generalissimo of uh, Yoruba Nation. Uh, so, uh, OPC we knew. And they did, uh, they, they fought to tunnel in the early 90s. Um, I mean, up to 2005 or thereabouts. But then it fizzled out, particularly after the presidency of Fulusha Gwambas Major. Because if you wanted out because you felt the Yorubas are marginalized, and you now have one of your own being president, what else do you need? Uh, so, uh, I, by the time of Basanjo emerged in 1999, the OPC agitation uh, fizzled out. And then, um, of course, OPC continued to exist uh, underground. They now carry out security. Some of them are members of the Amotekun Corps and all of that. But this whole separatist agitation under the uh, 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 what they call Yoruba Nation. Uh, it's a recent phenomenon. Just compared to what we had in the Southeast, where initially we had the Masol movement for the actualization of sovereign state of Biafra. And then eventually it metamorphosed into indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB. Uh, you recall that Masol was led by Chief Raf, who was Rike. Now, uh, IPOB is under Mars in Africa. So it's like that with uh, OPC and now the Yoruba nation agitators. But my question actually, as a Yoruba person, as a Yoruba man, I've been having an introspection. What do you want to gain by being out of Nigeria? Um, we have one of our whole now. We have one of our own who was number two citizen for eight years under Muhammadu Buhari 
uh, presidency. That's um, Professor Yemi Oshibadu. Now we have number one seat coming to the Yoruba nation in the person of Jagaban of Bogu, uh, President Volamet um, Tinobu. You have the chief of army staff, General Agbaja, who is from Oshun State. You have the chief, uh, you have the inspector general of police, Mr. Kyle Degbe Tokun. He's from, uh, I think he's from Ogun State. So, what if you if you are out of Nigeria, what else will you ask for? Is it not better to have number one seat under a huge umbrella or to go and have number one seat in a Ramshaku uh, country that is not that is going to be under severe threat by yeah. other And I don't know who are the sympathizers of this European yeah, nation. Mr. Mr. Ojo. And not, not long ago. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we may not be able to figure out, you know, what exactly they want. But, you know, following the story, you know, I did get to see, I, I mentioned this before, a person by the name um, Modupe Onitiri Abiola, uh, who is the well, self-proclaimed president of Yoruba Nation. I'm not sure who she is. Um, do you have any information about, you know, this individual or, you know, about what, what she might be about? Well, over the weekend, I've seen two clips. One, uh, this Modupa Onitiri Abiola, who is the widow of uh, Chief M.K. Abiola, yes. uh, coming out to say uh, she's one of the brain behind. But I've also seen another guy uh, who claimed to, I don't know whether he's the one that is now the president who is who also addressed uh, uh, should I say, address the Yoruba nation. I don't know whether to, to call it that. But these are just jokers. In, in truth and indeed, I, I will blame the security agencies in the Southwest for not ferreting out these individuals and charging them like they did charge in Amdi Kano. Because Yoruba, I don't know where they had that uh, referendum that they are made the leaders of Yoruba nation. Or, I mean, we know Afeni Ferry, we know Afeni Ferry under the leadership of uh, Pa uh, Ayofasurati of uh, Ondo State. We know the one under Pa Ayoade Banjo in Ogun State. Afeni Ferry has been there. Yoruba Council of Elders have been there. Uh, I've talked about OPC. I never knew who the uh, in masterminds of uh, Yoruba nation. Uh, initially, I think uh, Professor, uh, uh, what is his name now? Ilano uh, this professor, I've forgotten his name. And uh, Chief Sunday Bo was yeah. said to be the brain behind Yoruba nation. But these two have come out to dissociate themselves in a press statement over the weekend that they, they are not part of it. So what, what else will you... And these people rely on charm. Uh, you know, their own thought was that when they go, because of the charm that they are wearing, yeah, there is a charm called Aferi in Yoruba land, yeah. that when you wear that charm, you will be visible to your enemy, yeah. that they will oh. not see you. But, but they were seen. They were arrested. This is the, the, this is the illusion that uh, Eastern Security Network also has, that is making them to uh, perpetrate the havoc in the Southeast. And we need to curb this agitation because I really don't know what, what more you want out oh. of the Nigerian as a country that All we right. don't have now. We want, we want to take a very seat. short break. Then when we come back, we'll talk about what the possibilities are to, you know, to nip this agitation from further perpetrating itself in uh, the state. We'll be exactly. right back shortly. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. We're still joined by political affairs analyst Jide Ojo. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, before we went on the break, my question was, what needs to be done to ensure that we do not create a sect that is constantly pushing for agitation in the Southwest? Or is this something that is totally unavoidable? It is unavoidable. I think if the security agencies have been alive to their responsibilities, uh, this old Yoruba nation agitators should have been rounded off. Don't forget, uh, 
Chief Sunday Igbo, uh, who, who was leading the whole agitation at the initial, uh, the DSS went after him and they handed him into exile. In fact, I think there was one or two people that died in that, uh, in that siege on his home in Ibadan. And eventually he ran away to, to Benin Republic. And while he was trying to move to Germany, he was arrested. And uh, about two, three years he spent in incarceration before he eventually he was released. So, and he has come out to say, I'm not part of this. Uh, I think Professor Banja Akitoye, yeah. who is also leading the Lanaegbe Omo Dudua, has also come out to say, it's a splinter group from them uh, that, that is behind this whole idea. Did you remember uh, that in Oyos, there was uh, Amulunu Radio, uh, one of the branches of Radio Nigeria, that uh, is devoted to Yoruba programming. That this all these Yoruba agitators once uh, last year invaded the premises of that radio station, trying to forcefully take over the radio station. So now we 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 the security agencies, DSS, DIA, uh, and and police and other security agencies do not treat these people with levity. They must be handed, and their activities should be nipped in the bud. All right. I really, as a Yoruba person, I don't know what else we want out of Nigeria that God has not given us. We no. are in the number one position. We have been in number two position. We have produced two presidents of Nigeria, President uh, Olusha Gwambasanjo, and currently the president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, is a Yoruba man. He has appointed illustrious sons of and daughters of Yoruba into his cabinet and to keep position. Who is uh, the CBN governor today? He's a Yoruba man. Mr. Who is Aldo, the finance minister today? He's a Yoruba man. Mr. Aldo, Who is the chief of finance minister today? I have to interject today? at this point Who because we've run out of time for this conversation and we've, we're almost at the end of the show. But I'm hoping that the security agencies can hear what you're saying because, like you said, it is avoidable and can be nipped as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your time with us this morning. It's my pleasure. All right. I mean, and now from one serious conversation to another one, we are asking the question, which way Nigeria? About two months ago, investigative journalist and founder of the Foundation for Investigative Journalism, FIJ, Shisaya Shoyombo, began uh, putting out bits of his very shocking and disturbing reports on the alleged activities of men of Nigerian customs, from the alleged involvement in smuggling and assisting smugglers carry out their activities, alleged unlawful seizure of bags of rice and other items in nighttime raids that were allegedly never declared. Good morning, Customs NG, Visaya used to say every morning. In fact, Nigerians on X got used to seeing those greetings because, you know, they always came with more revelations from his investigative work. He also went as far as sharing pictures of properties uh, such as hotels and similar, you know, uh, buildings allegedly owned by high-ranking officials of Nigerian Customs. This, of course, is part of his job as an investigative journalist who has taken out time and resources and even risked his life to get valuable information. Did Fisayo get death threats? Yes, he did. Of course, you can see one of them here from an a ex-user. Now, for those who remember, there are two very popular examples of investigative reports that brought about change. First of them is the Watergate scandal. This happened in the United States in, some t in the 70s. The Washington Post investigative report, which was done by journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Beinstein, which um, uncovered the Watergate scandal in the early 1970s. Their series of articles revealed the Nixon administration's involvement in the break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters and subsequent cover-up. Now, this reporting led to a cascade of events, including congressional hearings and ultimately the resignation of President Richard Nixon. In 2016, which, of course, a lot of people remember this one, it's still fresh, the Panama Papers, it was done by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, ICIJ, 
and high, uh, it, it was of course, you know, published uh, a, a massive leak of financial documents exposing the offshore financial dealings of politicians, public officials, and wealthy individuals around the world, including here in Nigeria. The expose led to government investigations, legal actions, and changes in tax policies and regulations worldwide. But in our great country, Nigeria, the response to reports by Fisayo has been deafening silence of the Nigerian government. The Nigerian government has always been known to be, you know, seeming masters of evasion, masters of selective deafness, if you, if you can say that. The government has always had a similar approach towards revelations that make them look bad or expose them. The usual approach is to give it a few days to fizzle out as usual because they very well know how easily distracted the Nigerian people are. Just give it five days maximum and they will move on to other things like, you know, arguing if a wife should wake up at 4 a.m. to cook for her husband or maybe, you know, other life problems like who is on band A or who is on band C. And so, yes, they ignored. In another society, you would expect maybe not immediate consequences because these, of course, allegations need to first of all be investigated. But in a country where many people have spoken about how porous uh, you know, our borders are, and of course how the nature of these porous borders have always been a major concern with national security, how the ability to smuggle goods, goods in and out of Nigeria has continued to be a major concern in the fight against in, insecurity, you would expect that the Nigerian government will immediately start asking if these allegations are true or not. Just even imagine the previous administration didn't take these aspects of national security seriously. Are we then going to once again conclude that it's the same pattern with this new government? Ignore the issue. Don't bother yourself about it. National security, you know, will be fine. You know, there's no need to panic. Is it a government that turns its face the other way when there are such strong allegations against members of the same government that you are expecting would fix your country? Many people already have doubts as to whether the current administration has any serious plans to put Nigeria on the right path. A government that has the resources and quick judicial process against cases, you know, like the Bobrisky case, certainly can't see what Fisaya Shiombo has shared constantly for six weeks, ignored him completely and ignored these investigative findings. And that same government still wants Nigerians to believe that it has come to fix Nigeria. Moments like these are meant to be low-hanging fruits for a reasonable government to use. Just the easy things used to swing into action and show people that it means business. And slowly but surely, Nigerians are starting to accept that maybe, just maybe, this administration has no plans to do better than the other one. And so on behalf of Isaiah Shoyombo and the FIG and all the Nigerians, we say good morning customs and good morning Nigerians. And good morning is not only to customs, good morning to Nigeria, to our viewers. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll be back again same time, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. West African time, every weekday here on News Central. I am Olive Emoji. And I am Osaogi Ogbawa. See you tomorrow.